Sometime prior to March of 1995, Bruce Claflin, head of IBM's PC division, boarded an airplane and he took an important passenger with him, a prototype laptop. This laptop caught the attention and imagination of everyone that saw it, and Claflin enjoyed showing it off wherever he got the chance. He took his seat on the plane between an elderly man and an attractive young woman. This was an opportunity to let this prototype laptop impress some complete strangers and, perhaps, strike a conversation. Claflin pulled out a small, sleek, black box marked with the iconic ThinkPad badge to impress the young woman seated next to him. According to Claflin, this got her attention and distracted Claflin long enough for him not to notice a mixed drink that was delivered to him on the tray beside the laptop just before he opened it. This ensuing mishap was not what he wanted. As Claflin opened the lid, the keyboard expanded out the sides, struck the drink, and splashed it onto the lap of the same person he was trying to impress. Well, I got her to talk, but not in the way I had in mind, Claflin says. She shouted at me. When any list of iconic or innovative laptops is created, there is one that will always make that list. Its brilliant design placed it in the Museum of Modern Art. It is a design so captivating and creative, it has never been cloned or duplicated. When it was announced, everyone was talking about it. Even though it was made in a completely different era, people still talk about it. Welcome to Project Monarch, the story of the ThinkPad 701C and its TrackWrite keyboard, better known as the Butterfly. <laughs> This video series was made possible through years of research. Special thanks to the authors of the books ThinkPad, A Different Shade of Blue, How the ThinkPad Changed the World and is Shaping the Future, and The Race for Perfect Inside the Quest to Design the Ultimate Portable Computer. Also thanks to David Hill, George Caritas, Tom Hardy, and Ted Selker for sharing some of their knowledge about ThinkPad, IBM, and the development of the ThinkPad 701C. I also want to acknowledge DZ Technical, Matt from Project Butterfly, Justin, and others who have contributed their time in assisting me with the acquisition of parts and machines to study. I also want to thank these fine individuals for reviewing this script and providing their input. The story of the ThinkPad 701C begins with IBM and the successful launch of the very first ThinkPad, the 700C. If you're looking to learn more about the history of this event and IBM PC development leading up to it, please consider checking out my interviews with Tom Hardy on the subject. At this time, IBM had been wanting greater cooperation between its design labs to make better products as early as the 90s. There were several design labs around the world within IBM's corporate structure that had traditionally been encouraged to compete with each other. Raleigh in North Carolina was seen as the head of ThinkPad, while Yamato Labs in Japan, or the Early Manufacturing Involvement, EMI group, was to find efficiencies and fix issues. Raleigh was seen to have the core set of skills and brand management wanted another option if Yamato were to falter. This attitude brought about a desire at IBM to bring in other companies like Zenith to create artificial competition, sometimes at great expense, to drive the point home that Yamato had to deliver or alternatives would be sought. In some instances, these competitions were even lost to companies like Zenith, resulting them in producing products and parts for IBM instead of occurring in-house, and an example of this would be the ThinkPad 300 which was developed by Zenith Computers. Due to the Raleigh branch having the mainstay of skills during the start of ThinkPad development, 
it was selected to create a different ThinkPad, one that had never been seen before or since. At the time, the largest LCD was 10.4 inches diagonally, 4x3 aspect ratio, and it wasn't big enough for a full-size keyboard, which was anywhere between 12 and 13 inches. A ratio problem existed, meaning smaller notebooks had to be at least as large to accommodate the width of a keyboard, or risk being uncomfortable. But, IBM had a solution for this problem, named Dr. John Caritas. The words of Dr. John Caritas, the inventor of the iconic butterfly keyboard, or track right keyboard, is recorded in the book, ThinkPad, A Different Shade of Blue. There he stated, the butterfly concept was developed in the form of a photocopy of a keyboard in spring of 1993. We built various levels of prototypes during the summer and fall of that year, including a manually operated plexiglass model with two shifting keyboard elements. The decision to fund the development of butterfly came in the fall of 1993 with a planned introduction a year later. The development team felt that a one-year plan was extremely aggressive because 12 months was the standard time to develop a standard vanilla notebook without any innovations like the one planned for Butterfly. If you wish to learn more about Dr. John Caritas and the mind behind the TrackRite keyboard, I highly recommend you watch the interview I conducted with George Caritas, John's brother, and David Hill. While the TrackRite keyboard was brought on board in 1993, work started on the ThinkPad 701C back in 1992 under the direction of Nick King, shortly after the launch of the first ThinkPad 700C. The goal was to create a thin and light computer with a full-sized keyboard and show a US development team could produce an amazing product. Many laptops at the time were 9 inches and had a compact or reduced functionality keyboard to get around the issue of size. Using the mechanism developed by Dr. Caritas, this was going to change the aspect ratio of the keyboard when stored to fit within the chassis. It is worth mentioning at this point that there was speculation that Tim Cook, Apple CEO from 2011 onward, who at the time was a fulfillment director at IBM in Raleigh, was directly involved with the development of the ThinkPad 701C and his potential involvement is somewhat alluded to in the book, How ThinkPad Changed the World and is Shaping the Future. But sources have questioned the likelihood of him directly influencing development, as his role at that time would have been related in the manufacturing and distribution of parts and machines, which would have just started by the time he left IBM in 1994. There is also no record of him attending any design meetings, so this story unfortunately cannot be confirmed. Shifting our attention back to the development of the TrackRite keyboard, Dr. Caritas described his inspiration for the keyboard thusly. If the keyboard and display had the same aspect ratio, you could put them in a smaller box. There was little that could be done about the display aspect ratio if you wanted to keep the standard 4x3 aspect ratio and have all the software work. But there was at least one theoretical opportunity to change the aspect ratio of the keyboard. At that point, I flashed the image of these wooden blocks I had bought for my three-year-old daughter. I compared the keyboard with this pair of triangular blocks I had. They made it along a diagonal slice that allowed you to slide the blocks together. When you did this, the combined width of the two blocks got a little narrower and the depth increased. In a sense, a long thin rectangle turned into more of a square and that was what we needed the keyboard to do but you couldn't just cut the keyboard on a smooth diagonal because it had overlapping rows of keys. I thought about cutting a stair-step diagonal. I made some photocopies of the ThinkPad 700 keyboard and thought about how much I needed to shrink it and where the diagonal had to be. I approximated the straight diagonal with a step-stair diagonal and started cutting up the photocopies. I rearranged them until I found a solution that let the keyboard match very nicely in the extended position. In the collapsed position, it was approximately 2 inches narrower, squarer, and almost matching the width of the 10.4 inch display. So this basic concept led to trying to find a thin, inexpensive, durable mechanism that reliably closed the keyboard and expanded it smoothly when deployed. With a small team of fellow engineers, we went through several iterations on the actual mechanism. The product evolved from there. 
After a prototype was built with the help of co-inventors Gerald McVicker and Michael Goldowski, a mechanical engineer Larry Stone and a manufacturing engineer Gary Friedley, it was presented to the Industry and Customer Advisory Councils. Their reaction was disbelief that something like this could exist. A full-size keyboard and a compact sub-notebook package. There was a great deal of excitement and wonder shared by those in attendance. When General Manager Bruce Claflin was asked about when it would be ready, he stated, before year-end. This would not be an easy road for the design team for the Butterfly. In fall of 1993, it was decided to fund Butterfly with the planned introduction a year later. It was hard to find someone who wasn't excited about the ThinkPad 701C, and it meant the resources that were put into its development were second to none. Expectations were also just as high, if not higher. However, this was the same amount of time allotted for the development of a regular notebook without any special features. It did not take into account the incredible challenges of taking this conceptual prototype and turning it into a retail product. This would become a trend in the development of the 701C. Even the name was an uphill battle at IBM. Gary Purdy and Debbie Dell were given the task of naming the product and the keyboard, and there were significant disagreements. Butterfly was supposedly a name for a supercomputer being developed by another company, so it couldn't be safely trademarked without a potential legal battle. There was then the matter of what numbered series it best fit, and the decision was ultimately made on the quality of the device rather than the size, which somewhat broke tradition. It was decided it would be classified as a 700 series after considering 40 different names, including the previously mentioned Butterfly. Another term, Expanza, was also popular. However, IBM Brazil wrote an internal memo cautioning marketing that this had a sexual connotation in Brazil. If it wasn't for that concern, it is very likely that it would have been called the Expanza instead of the Trackrite. Unofficially, of course, it would still be called the Butterfly Keyboard. Troubles did continue, and it wasn't just with the name, as development ran into significant problems. At the next IAC meeting, the update on the ThinkPad 701C not shipping until spring 1995 was dropped. This was due to problems with the keyboard mechanism. The IAC cautioned IBM that the Pentium was on the horizon, as were larger displays. The ThinkPad 701C was going to ship with a 486 and larger screens were releasing soon. The clock had started on the product and it hadn't even been shipped yet. The hearts and minds of IBM executives were captured by the TrackRite keyboard. Dr. Caritas in late 1992, after watching his daughter, who was three at the time, play with wooden blocks, specifically triangle shapes, that fit together to make rectangular shapes, saw the solution to IBM's woes. Dr. Caritas made photocopies of the existing IBM keyboard designed for laptops and cut them up in different ways to see how they might fit together. These prototypes were made into plexiglass copies, then actual prototype keyboards. Needless to say, it impressed people enough and the TrackRite keyboard was slated to be tried on the 701C being designed at Raleigh. While top management at IBM wanted the Raleigh Design Labs and others like the Yamato Design Labs to collaborate, it was difficult to get the two to share. IBM had set up a highly competitive model in their research divisions that made the exchange of ideas more like a bartering game. Aramasa Naito remembers both sides being too guarded for significant progress to occur, and this would contribute to problems later on. Chris Farrell, one of the original Raleigh team members, remembers vividly the challenges of getting the product to launch. The engineering team worked late hours to keep up with the schedule that marketing had set for its release. Farrell reflected, Every person on the design team was determined that his or her piece would be the best of breed in the industry without question. When the 701 shipped, it was on every magazine cover. The list of awards filled three pages and they weren't even just for the keyboard. At announced the system had the maximum display size in the market, the fastest modem available, integrated telephony and sound, removable hard drives, and infrared support. None were yet industry standard. Fast forward to mid-summer of 1993, development was not looking good. There were some problems with communication between the teams, as well as the technical problems 
with its development, including the durability and reliability of the mechanism, which had to last at least 30,000 operations. Joe Formicelli, who would replace Bruce Claflin as the general manager of mobile computing when Claflin moved to the role of president of PC Company Americas. However, the transition was not a smooth one, and the ThinkPad team was without a general manager for four months, which further fueled internal chaos. Once Formicelli stepped into his new role replacing Claflin, there was a mess to be found, and he recalled some of these issues. Now, to be sure, Butterfly got a lot of accolades. We won Product of the Year, we won Computer of the Year at Comdex, everybody oohed and awed at the keyboard and wondered how we packed a 10.4 inch screen inside that tiny box. The consultants and analysts thought it was astounding. It was an absolutely exciting time. It would have been great if we had only could have come out a year earlier on the original schedule. When I got on board with ThinkPad in November of 1993, I was told the design completion was imminent with a planned product introduction in early fall of 1994. Because of the delays in getting the engineering for the expandable keyboard worked out, the butterfly actually announced on March 6, 1995. Shortly after arriving as general manager, I went to Raleigh and conducted a design review with the team. What did I find out? First, the plastic guys had not even talked to the display guys and whether or not the panel actually fit in the case. The display guys had yet to talk to the stamping guys to see whether or not all the pieces fit together. Metal shards were dropping off of the trial production line. I certainly didn't want metal shavings inside my portables. And, by the way, I never told anybody this, but the thing wouldn't open and close without breaking. When you open and close the cover, the hinge would break. The total design was my worst nightmare. John Caritas, who got all the accolades for the butterfly design, was off developing something else. I went berserk. I got him back, and I got him to focus full-time on getting it fixed. Formicelli was successful, but Caritas was apparently reluctant to be pulled away from other projects. Formicelli felt that Caritas was only interested in the design of the concept, but not creating the working product. As the story is told in The Race for Perfect by Steve Hamm, as remembered by John, they argued, and when they left Formicelli's office to go talk to another executive about the issue, Formicelli shouted at Caritas all the way down the hallway. He said, You got us into this, and now you're going to get us out, Caritas recalls. Formicelli did get his way. For the next six months, Caritas traveled to New York to Raleigh every week and stayed at a Holiday Inn near IBM's campus in the Research Triangle Park. Once reliability and durability were improved, there were problems with the flexible cable that sent signals from the keyboard to the motherboard. This was solved in a considerably less dramatic way. After considerable testing, it was discovered that a small metal clip that cost less than a penny held the delicate ribbon cable in place and stopped the reliability issues. IBM had worked hard to build excitement for the 701C and models were being shown to journalists early under strict non-disclosure agreements. The 701C became a favorite of key members of IBM and having the project fail would not look good for those involved. Prototypes were given to different executives within the company to show off it in a variety of settings. At this time, there was an intense pressure for ThinkPad as a brand to perform. Bruce Claflin, in his new role, discovered that the PC business was in turmoil. In 1993, IBM lost $1 billion, and in 1994 only earned $50 million. In short, the only section of the PC division that was finding consistent success was ThinkPad, so missteps could be catastrophic. Claflin did remain aware of the ThinkPad's team's efforts and even had a prototype of the 701C which he would travel with, even though it did get him occasionally into trouble, spilling drinks on airlines. Claflin was able to redeem himself, however, after the incident somewhat, by assisting with the crafting of an ad, because shortly after release of the laptop, he was made aware of the following story. Because it was so small and light, the model found a new audience for ThinkPad. Women. Claflin recalls around the time of the introduction, two female reporters approached one of his product managers and told her, you finally created a product for women. He overheard the snippet of conversation and decided on the spot to begin marketing the 701C to women. 
One of the print ads that had been developed for the computer showed a man holding one of the slim machines with just three fingers. Claflin ordered the ad people to airbrush out the hair and make other changes to transform it into a woman's hand. For better or for worse, there was a great focus on the 701C, and Formicelli further recalled steps that he took to keep the project on track. Despite his effort, they were racing against the clock as the release of what would make a 486 laptop obsolete, the Intel Pentium, and larger displays had already been announced. I flew to Raleigh and met with the team there every single week. I had them show me the bolts, the screws, what they were doing on every little thing. I reviewed the dates, I scrubbed the actions of the stamping guys, the keyboard guys, and the monitor guys. That's what it took. But it was so damn late. Although we had innovation in spades, by the time we introduced the butterfly in March of 1995, everyone was talking about converting to Pentium notebooks, not 486s. Even though the 486 would be obsolete due to the release of the Pentium, the chipset could not be updated on the 701C due to the increased amount of heat that it would generate. It would require a complete redesign of the thermal solution, something that they didn't have time for, especially coupled with the display technology becoming better. The entire design revolved on the older processor, and delaying the 701C was simply not an option. Launched in March of 1995 for 3800 US dollars, it was the most pre-ordered laptop offered by IBM at that point. Every single major and minor computer news outlet was talking about the innovative computer and its amazing keyboard. Reviewers were initially favorable to the device and its creative approach to the full-size keyboard in a sub-notebook size device. The price of the device was a detractor for several, however, as it was compared to more powerful portables being released at the same time. Its 486 was underpowered compared to the rise of the Pentium. Had the 701C been released earlier as planned, it would have likely had a larger market impact. It enjoyed six months of good press and plenty of awards before being surpassed by laptop computers with a better screen and CPU combinations. IBM had another challenge. In the years leading up to the release of the 701C, demand for ThinkPads were far outpaced by IBM's ability to supply them. This meant these machines were very difficult to acquire. Upper management made it clear that this could not happen to the 701C as it was going to be a highly desirable product. So they insisted parts were readily available to build units. Formicelli reflects on this in the pages of ThinkPad A Different Shade of Blue. We had ordered parts based on the preceding year's demand. The processor ended up being our most deficient feature. We couldn't use the Pentium in such a small package because it generated too much heat. We were stuck launching Butterfly with 46 processors. As a result, although IBM did have an innovative product, it was announced with a processor that was out of date and a display that was quickly becoming too small. IBM did the only thing that it could at the time. They stopped ordering parts, reduced the price, and cleared the inventory. While the 701C was an innovative product with a bold solution to a problem, it was not a problem that everyone had, and members of the team knew beyond the wow factor of the keyboard, it might not be an item many customers would be able to justify. Bruce Claflin recalls the situation as follows. From our previous sub-notebook experiences, we knew that this was a niche category. We were enamored with the potential of a sub-notebook because a sensational demand existed for small and light. Our first sub-notebook, the ThinkPad 500, was mediocre. It wasn't a disaster, but it certainly wasn't a success. IBM learned a lesson from this first sub-notebook entry. We should have only built enough units for the expected market, especially because our experience told us how many units we could expect to sell. This lesson was initially called into play when we did the famous butterfly product. Although I was supportive of the innovative design with the expandable keyboard, I consciously kept the volume plan low. The team's goal was to not get so excited about the innovation that you bought a million parts, found out later that you had inventory everywhere, and had to slash the price to cut the losses. Initially, I was successful keeping the volume plan relatively low. After all, this was a niche product. It was never going to be mainstream. I remember the day that I finally made a mistake. It was the day we announced the 701. Lou Gerstner called Rick Thoman and said, I am sick and tired of you guys being short on supply. Whatever you do with this latest blockbuster, don't get caught short on supply again. In spite of research indicating the 701 was truly a niche sub-notebook, 
I made a dreadful decision and increased the volume plan on announcement day. We immediately qualified new suppliers for critical parts in our plants in Mexico and an additional manufacturing site. We decided to go for volume in a big way. The product was initially successful, but only for a narrow niche of users. The long-term demand was significantly less than the volumes in which we had just committed. We had to slash volume back and aggressively price to move it out of the channel. If we had kept the original volume plan, it would have proven a satisfactory product. It did well in its niche as an innovative product. Limited volume would have commanded a price premium. But in trying to move Butterfly from niche to mainstream, we raised the volume and ended up slashing inventory and taking a major financial hit. In retrospect, we should have done a better job of target marketing. We should have targeted highly successful individuals with moderate demands for keyboard, screen, and technology, high requirements for small and light, and a willingness to pay a premium to meet their requirements. In fact, that was the original plan until the day of announcement. I'm the guy who caved on the demand. At this point, the prices of the 701C and 701CS dropped continuously over the months to come as IBM tried to liquidate its inventory before the machine became any more obsolete than it had already been in the eyes of potential customers. While Raleigh had delivered the 701C late, the Amato Labs where Aramasa Naito was stationed were solving several problems and releasing models like the 750C in 1993 and the 755 in 1994. Bruce Claflin, who is the general manager of IBM's PC division, flew to Japan to ask Naito to take over the future of the Butterfly keyboard computer. It was at this time that Raleigh found out that Yamato had won the full support of brand management and that all portables were going to be developed there instead of in Raleigh. The Butterfly team was going to be broken up and moved to desktop development. There were several pleas to several people within IBM, including ThinkPad's general manager and IBM CEO. They wanted to stay working on mobile computers and working with each other. Their requests were ignored and the team was split apart. Other ThinkPad products were also decommissioned around this time, like the ThinkPad 755CV and 755CDV, which had a unique feature that allowed the lid to open and the screen to be laid over an overhead projector. Aramasa Naito would go to North Carolina to meet with the members of the team to keep the butterfly concept going, but no one showed up to the meeting. It is possible that they knew the likelihood of keeping what made the butterfly team so special was simply not going to be possible. The design lab at Raleigh was shut down, and only Yamato remained as the last ThinkPad design and engineering team. The Butterfly keyboard, and by extension, the ThinkPad 701C, was amazing because of what it was, not what it did. Putting a full-sized keyboard into a subcompact package, crammed with the latest technology that was on offer at the time. Dr. John Caritas would receive an IBM corporate award of $50,000 for his work on the TrackRite keyboard, and join the rest of IBM and the ThinkPad team receiving dozens of awards for its design. It was clear that it left a mark and captured the imagination of many people. Yamato made a model kit and gave it away on the 10th anniversary of ThinkPad. These kits were of the Japanese version of the machine and can still be found online from time to time. For many, this is as close as one will ever get to experiencing the track right mechanism. There have been several attempts since the creation of the original to recapture the magic of this machine. David Hill was working on another project that explored the return of the TrackRight keyboard called BentoFly, also known as Butterfly 2. The computer was to be one inch thick and have a similar mechanism. However, the mechanism didn't solve a similar existing problem and was dropped due to the needless complexity and the weight. During the time that this was being worked on in 2006, 13 inch screens were also popular, also reducing the need. Simply put, it didn't seem like the world needed a butterfly keyboard anymore. However, in June of 2021, I found a patent application for a modernized butterfly keyboard and published an article on my website. While it hasn't led to the creation of any real product, it shows that Lenovo understands the importance and hasn't completely given up on the idea. 
Will butterflies fly again? If they do, it would undoubtedly capture excitement around the world. Thank you for watching.